Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, yes, today we're going to be talking about physical attacks against smartphones. Um, so the crux of this talk is that I was seeing a huge number of different conference talks about um, extremely complex attacks against smartphones due to the high measures of security that are placed on them from the boot level all the way up to the high level OS. Um, and despite this, there are still times when very simple techniques can be used to bypass the security on smartphones and escalate privileges or get unauthorized access in ways that you would consider very simple in a general sense. Um, so we're going to be doing two 20-minute case studies for this. The first one is going to be gaining root access on a smartphone with no bootloader unlocking capability. This is where the manufacturer removes the ability to unlock the bootloader and root it by itself. And the second is going to be gaining code execution in the bootloader of a Samsung smartphone um, in order to bypass secure boot and execute your own kernel and do other malicious things. So um, case study one, routing on a locked bootloader. Essentially, I'd bought a brand new phone and wanted to root my old one so that I could use it for app tech testing and that sort of thing, install my own certificates, add Frida, et cetera. However, on this particular device, the manufacturer had gone into the code of the bootloader and removed the checks to allow you to access the USB interface. This meant that I would never be able to um, get into the fast boot uh, mode and unlock the bootloader, add root access, and that sort of thing. Um, OEMs very rarely do this, and they usually just add restrictions onto the bootloader that requires them to um, you to uh, sign up with their services in order to do this properly. Um, the target device was a smartphone from a Chinese OEM released in 2019 that used an OEM developed fork of Android, which had its own security features and other um, tweaks to it that were going to be the target of this uh, particular project. So while I say that it didn't have bootloader unlocking capabilities in a traditional sense, what it did have was a special engineering app that permitted bootloader unlocking. This used a uh, signature stored in a partition on the device, um, which was inaccessible to standard users, but could then be used by the special engineering app with special permissions and written into it. And then when the device rebooted, it would give other engineering level access. It was not publicly available, though there were some leaks online, and it required an approved user account, which was a long-winded process I didn't want to go through. Um, so when bootloader unlocking isn't available, it's ob obvious that you're going to need some kind of exploit in order to escalate privileges to root. Um, and with no direct access to the bootloader USB interface, which is my standard approach for attacking a device like this, a vulnerability was needed in the Android fork itself. I didn't think I'd find anything in Android that would be um, particularly actionable in this sense, and I thought the changes that I'd made to it would be probably the area where I'd find the most critical vulnerabilities I could use. What I found was the Android fork contained a high number of custom system and root level applications, um, which could be potentially exploited in different ways. Um, so the Android fork had a service running at root as a root at all times that was called by the system level applications um, for the facilitation of cloud upload and archiving of um, app data. So we would take um, all the data from the uh, user's protected um, application and cordoned off partitions, um, package it all together and upload it to the cloud where it could be downloaded again if needed. Um, brief analysis of this binary found that it had an immediate command injection vulnerability where if you had a file within the file system with backticks in the name, you could execute commands within it. Um, what would happen is you'd upload this file and then download it again, and as it was restoring the file, it would then execute whatever command was in the backticks. So very basic. Unfortunately for me, Android also employs SE Linux, which is an extremely strong security measure to cordon off different components of the um, operating system, even if they are all running as root. This meant that even though I had root access superficially, I only had access to the app data sections of the device, rather than having the access to um, other components I wanted to modify. Um, I found that pretty much every instance of um, a command injection I could find on the device had a similar issue, so I'd have to find an another way of getting ex uh, escalated privileges. Um, most vulnerabilities that are limited by SE Linux um, uh, context could probably be bypassed with a kernel exploit. However, a kernel exploit is a very complex thing to do and not something you want to be doing for a very basic, simple project you're just doing in your spare time. Um, and as the bootloader was locked down and the exploit, OS exploits are out of the question, I decided to go for my next best option, which would be recovery mode on the device. So recovery mode on an Android device is traditionally is a very, very simple menu which you use the volume buttons and the power button in order to navigate through it. I found that on this Android fork they'd actually updated this to include Wi-Fi access, access to more parts of external storage, and a few other options, as well as having the touch screen enabled, which I found was due to the fact that they'd taken their Android kernel and dumped it into the recovery partition, meaning that if I'd gain access to it, I'd have access to all the same hardware components the traditional Android operating system was. 
So I wanted to find an update image um, for the um, uh, entire operating system of the device so that I could extract recovery and then find a simple vulnerability. Unfortunately, downloading the updated um, the update files for this device found that they never updated the recovery um, partition, meaning that I couldn't find it within the operating system. That meant that um, I would have to work out any vulnerabilities blind and just guess and just try things until something worked. Um, so yeah, with no recovery image to reverse engineer, I just tried very basic attacks to begin with. Um, as the menu option included uh, the option to load in these encrypted zip files, the OT update images, I decided to attempt those first. So as I found a command injection vulnerability in the high level operating system, I thought I would probably find one in the recovery image as well. So I took a legitimate encrypted update file for the device and renamed it to contain backticks and sleep 30,000. What would happen is if I uh, had successfully executed this command, the phone would be spending a few hours trying to update itself with never succeeding. Um, yes, and this did indeed cause the update process to hang, demonstrating that I'd found yet another command injection vulnerability in the device. Um, I disclosed all the command inv injection vulnerabilities I had found to the OEM, who very, very swiftly remediated them and updated new versions of the software. Um, but as the recovery mode command injection was very likely to be running as root and have no restrictions on it, this would be a good basis for me to then gain further root access to Android. So I started with root cause analysis just so I could get out of the way and found that it was a SHA-1 sum check um, for some logging that was checking um, data on the, uh, uh, the SHA-1 sum of the update file, um, which was then just uh, executing the backticks because they were doing sprintf into an exec command, so very basic. Um, as there was a command injection variable in the file name, um, this could probably be used to update a more complex script. So if I wrote a more complex script, uh, Base64 encoded it and piped it into a system bin sh, um, a shell, shell script could then be loaded that's more complex from the file system and executed. So this um, script here literally just cats from the user data partition a much more complex script that can be used. Unfortunately, the file system that used by Android's user data does not support all special characters. For instance, the pipe character I would need to perform this exploit. So I would have to find a way around this. Luckily, I found that they had modified the um, recovery image to also support ext4 file systems, which is rare on Android. And usually when you put an ext4 um, SD card into an Android device, it says unsupported um, file system and then tries to format it. Um, luckily for me, it didn't do that. So I could just load my more complex update file onto that and execute it. So I wanted to get a more concrete shell on the device so I'd have a look around um, and also work out what was going on in a more uh, accessible manner. Um, so what I did was I ran the IT command and run it into the user part data partition so that if I wanted to um, reboot the phone, I would then find it was running ID root or ID system or whatever was going on. I also wanted to see if I could disable SC Linux to bypass all of the um, contexts that were there and found that that also worked. And then I also wanted to enable ADB on the device so I had a root shell into recovery, which all also worked quite well. Um, so root access in recovery mode is great, but you've then got a phone that's in a very, uh, not very fairly fleshed out mode. I can't access any apps from there. I can't uh, modify my files in any real way, and I can't usually access the internet, Bluetooth, or anything like that. Um, what I wanted to do was find a way to switch from recovery to Android without ever having to reboot the device and go to the bootloader, because as soon as I do that, I would lose my um, shell on the device because there was no persistence in an attack like this. My first port of call was to try to use kexec. Now, kexec is a um, kernel um, component which allows you to load a new Linux kernel onto a Linux uh, uh, device and then execute that, essentially switching from one Linux kernel to another. Um, if I could do that, that would be a very quick way for me to switch to the Android kernel and everything else. But unfortunately, even compiling the module from scratch was blocked because it was using some um, deny listed uh, uh, module components. So I just tried to do something, decided to try to do something that was in the user space rather than in the kernel itself. Luckily, there was ptrace. Now, ptrace is a system call allowing one process to observe and control another for debugging purposes. Um, so typically, this is for things like um, logging and tracking and debugging on things that are running on the operating system and doing things like you know, the strace command within Linux. Um, it can even um, modify memory that is um, write denied um, in the standard processes, um, which means you can modify running code even if you're not meant to be able to do that in the particular um, ELF that you're working with. What I wanted to do was use ptrace to essentially latch onto the init process and restart that, but in the Android context. So 
in it is um, always process ID one, um, which uh, means that it has some special privileges within Linux, and also it has a lot of control over the rest of the system. Um, what I wanted to do was use the execv here command, which um, executes a command within one process but uses the same process ID to run more commands that would then get me to switch out in it. Um, luckily for me, if I did this, I could um, execute uh, in it but never have to return back to it. I could just keep things going as one long process switching from one set of data to the other. Um, and this could be very trivially done with a bit of uh, um, assembly code, so just moving in the parameters and then ex executing the service call. Um, switch root is what's used during the boot process, usually to switch from the init RAMFS, so the, um, the RAM disk, which contains some of the lower level stuff um, for mounting the more complex file systems, um, into the new one. Uh, it's a very common feature on Linux based devices, and what I intended to do was switch from one init RAMFS to the Android init RAMFS, which would then load into the system operating system. Uh, this could be very easily done if I just uh, mounted a new RAM disk and then loaded the data in, and then hopefully I could then switch into it if I needed. So the process for init usually looks like this on Android. You do have the init process that starts as one, then it sets up SE Linux, and then it does init second stage, which has all the hardware set up and everything, and that's where the process sits most of the time. And essentially what I wanted to do was inject in a switch root command into init, which would then start that whole process again, killing the old recovery process and introducing the new one that was running Android. Um, there are a few caveats with this, however, because um, no one's really intended to switch from one init run FS to another, and you're meant to reboot to get into other systems like this. Um, so a core component of switch root is the remounting of mounted folders. Um, however, most of the mounted folders that occur in Android at this point are shared. This means they're handled in slightly different ways um, than how you expect when it comes to things like moving the mounts to different places. However, this could be trivially resolved by just writing a small shell script that go went through all the mounts, found out if they were shared, and made them private instead. And private means they could be moved around wherever they I wanted within the file system. Um, also, I found that the init binary was checking proc command line um, within the, the file system for whether the image required SE Linux to be enabled. And if it did, it w and it found it was disabled, it would uh, enable SE Linux, um, forcibly re-enabling it, even though I disabled it. Um, luckily for me, um, ptrace allows you to override system calls, so I modified the read system call whenever it touched the proc command line file to override the um, check for enforcing SE Linux with one that allowed it to be permissive, which was nice and easy. Um, I also found that this caused a lot of kernel panics because in it also does all the system hardware services set up. Um, this includes things like setting up the Wi-Fi interface, Bluetooth, etc. Um, but the recovery um, operator side of the thing, things had already done this, so doing this again caused the kernel to not really know what to do. Um, what I did was in the same way as I've done with Proxim Online, just make it return empty files whenever it tried to access these .rc files. I did this because then I wouldn't have to modif modify them within the file system, which would cause the device to not be able to work in a non-rooted manner. Um, I also found that when I tried to unlock my phone after getting through this entire process and getting it to boot, that I could no longer use my PIN because all of the security services were still running in the recovery context. Luckily for me, I could just kill all these processes and let init restart them again right as I was starting this whole process up. Um, while this was pretty much a read-only process, and if I rebooted the device, I'd lose all of this um, root access, what I could do was still mod um, override some read-only files. So the system partition, which calls, um, stores a lot of the system data, um, is a read-only file system. Um, it uses uh, DM Verity to make sure it's got um, appropriate um, uh, signatures working throughout the file system. However, if you use the mount dash dash bind command, you can over, uh, override the files there temporarily with your own, meaning that if I wanted to modify, for instance, the frameworks which had root detection in and things like that, I just need to do that and temporarily and it would work without damaging the device in any way. Um, so we're going to do a quick demo of this boot process now before we move on to the next one. Uh, so hopefully this won't go to the next one. So brilliant, sorry guys. Um, as you can see, I've just um, pressed my little um, command there, and now it's now running through the init process. It then kills recovery, um, which was running the screen at that point, and starts the Android process booting up. So then starting the full Android operating system and give me root access. I also found that trying to unlock the phone when I started this, I'd need to reboot, it, otherwise, uh, reboot the screen, otherwise I couldn't use the touch screen. And then, yeah, we have a telnet root backdoor into the device.
Oh, thank you. So I observed something quite interesting after this. I was quite happy to have root access, but I realized that during the debugging process, I'd kept a busy box telnet server within the recovery context of the device. Um, and when I'd remounted the new init RAM FS, I'd found that the old recovery one was still sitting in memory and accessible. So there was a telnet service running in a file system that Android had no idea about. Um, Switch root had deleted all the files within this file system because it was stored in RAM, but just using BusyBox, I could repopulate all the tools, and it gave me this like, secret little um, section of the device which Android didn't really have access to. Um, because it was hidden from Android, I could do a lot of interesting things accessing the hardware and stuff, but I could also access the rest of Android itself without Android knowing that I was there. So by CDing or shrooting into the directory proc1 root, which was the um, root file system that the init process is using, recovery could access the Android root file system as root without Android knowing about it, which was fantastic. Um, what I decided to do is expand this out, however, and add a whole Debian root file system to the device, giving me a lot of debugging and testing tools that I could also use to continue to compromise the device in further ways. Um, so, root, in conclusion, root access by this method was very consistent. I left the thing running with the init parasite ptrace tool attached to it for days at a time without any crashes. It would just keep running and running and running and no problem whatsoever. Um, I also found that by, just by rebooting the device I had no ill effects and it could operate normally, going back to a standard non-rooted device with no awareness that I'd manipulated in this way. Um, and I also found that um, the biggest benefit for this whole project was having ptrace there. So if you're compiling a kernel, do remove that if you need to. Now we move on to the second case study, which is a bit more technical and a bit more exciting because we're not going for a device that I wanted to root for my own purposes, but I just wanted to exploit in some way. So Exynos based devices have had a significant amount of re research done on them on this stage and at Black Hat as well in previous years, but they all focused on the download mode of the bootloader. So this is a high level protocol used by Samsung to um, write and read files in different ways and debug the device and unbrick it in many ways. Um, because it all focused on the high level download protocol, I decided to start a project to try and access, the, um, try and manipulate the low level USB stack that was in use to see if I could find a vulnerability that was as actionable as the, what had already been found. For this, I found the cheapest Samsung device I could that was still of decent quality and modern, which was a Samsung Galaxy AO4S, which was actually quite a de decent phone after I bought it. Um, it was released in August 2022 and used an Exynos 850 chipset, and I knew that it would be quite an interesting target because it had a lot of the security features like Knox in place that more expensive, more modern, or more higher-end Samsung devices do. So. The secondary bootloader, which is what I was going for with this project, is called S-Boot in Samsung, and it facilitates a few things. It facilitates standard boot from the primary bootloader all the way up to Android. It facilitates download mode, which is the protocol we were just talking about. On my device, it also had fast boot mode, which is the standard Android um, administration's um, bootloader tool, and upload mode, which is what's usually found when you hit an unrecoverable error in some way. All of this was encompassed in a single firmware binary called sboot.bin, um, but because of this, I thought all three USB protocols, so download, fastboot, and USB, would probably be using the core USB stack underneath, which if I could find a vulnerability in, I would have broken all of those in one go. So when I'm talking about USB core, uh, the core USB stack, I'm talking about USB control transfer. So control transfers are used to send and receive like debugging information, or not rather, not debugging information, configuration information about the device. Sometimes it's used for more complex things. For instance, iPhones, DFU modes also use control transfers, but generally there's a very standardized approach for these. And they use standard parameters, which are BM request type, B request, W value, W index, buffer, and buffer size. So. What I really wanted to do was just fuzz it and find a actual exploit just by running a very basic fuzzer. Now, control transfers are mostly extremely stateless. They uh, do their own thing, you read and write data, and at a very high level, there's just not much else you need to do. Um, with this, you can just randomize all the parameters and send a randomized buffer size with randomized data in it and see what happens. So as you can see there, my very complex fuzzer, you know, way better than uh, you know, AFL of rand, 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 rand for every parameter. Um, and as, as you can see on the right, when I was running this, you'll see the minus nine errors, which are libUSB errors, which is where the device has gone, I don't know what the hell to do with this. All the ones without the minuses is where data has been transferred back and forth. So very simple to keep track of. However, during my initial fuzzing attempts, I was sending purely random data, and it caused the device to reboot into a failure mode that I re couldn't recover from. Every time I tried to reboot, it said the same thing. An error has been occurred updating the device software, and I thought I'd got, now got a brick on my hands. 
Uh, this occurred when the OXF6 value was sent as the B request parameter, which was very interesting because I uh, didn't know why that would be. It's not a standard command or anything like it. Um, however, I found it was recoverable and um, back to uh, uh, a working device by using download mode tools. So I used the command line tool in Heimdall, which is an open source tool for manipulating download mode that's accessible on GitHub. And as soon as I tried to do anything with that tool, the device decided it was working again. So clearly it just didn't like my tool. So I kept fuzzing and fuzzing and fuzzing for about half an hour and found that the device would crash and reboot, reboot after a certain set of transfers. Luckily I had a seed in this fuzzing so I knew exactly what could be done and I could just run the whole on target fuzz again and see what happened. And what I did was essentially remove transfers in the sequence to see which ones were actually causing the crash in the first place. So I essentially got that down to two control transfers after, after uh, over about 10,000, which was nice. So the first transfer was a malformed get descriptor request. So in that instance, it's got get, and it was sending data instead of receiving it. And the second was a valid get descriptor request, which was causing the crash. Now, get descriptor is a core component of the USB um, stack um, and it's control transfers that retrieves descriptors about the device. These are configuration data, which includes things like strings about who manufactured the device, um, IDs, and also what the device does, which is very nice. Um, in these descriptors, the first byte of the data is always um, going to be the size of the buffer itself. So you can see B length is 18, um, which is the size. And if you can overwrite this, you can then make your uh, memory access push into the linked list next to it, which is where the other descriptors are stored usually. So what's interesting is most uh, USB stacks don't control the trans um, check the control transfer direction. Uh, they're usually protected by how their own USB hardware works, so they have send and receive functions. So for instance, in this case, this is the STM32 USB D stack, where if you send it a get uh, device descriptor request, it will explicitly send a control send data request to its own hardware, meaning that it can't receive data back from it. However, in this instance, I could send data to it, meaning that I had full control overwriting data in memory, which was very nice. So what I did was try to overwrite that first byte just by sending data to the same memory that was there. However, this was ineffective and it did change the byte. However, it didn't alter the size of the data received. Luckily for me, there was just a buffer overflow there anyway, so I was quite happy. Um, because of this, the data next to the buffer could be overwritten, but I didn't know what there was there yet. Um, but I could just try and guess. So by sending a large buffer uh, that caused the device to crash, I um, knew that I had a tra traditional buffer overflow hitting something. So I decided to um, do a you know, binary check until I found a data size that didn't cause the device to crash. Then I made that size one byte larger and um, saw if it crashed. And then if it did crash, change the value of that last byte incrementing by one until I found a value that didn't crash. Essentially, I was brute forcing my way up the adjacent memory until I found fully working memory that I could then manipulate if I wanted. What was excellent about this was, was that next to it was a linked list which included pointers to other descriptors which would then be overwritten themselves. And this had two key benefits to me. Number one, this could be used for a cold boot attack. So for instance, if I had someone's Samsung phone and rebooted it, the memory wouldn't be cleared at that time. And I could dump the entirety of memory at EL1, so all of the external RAM, and then get their secrets out of it, something they'd been typing, anything that was stored in RAM at that time. But the second thing I could do was write to all of that data as well, including to the bootloader. So the first thing I did was when I dumped memory of the device, so I knew the memory layout of the bootloader itself so I could then manipulate it later. So I found that all of the pointers I was looking at were between OXF9 uh, and the six zeros and OXF8 and six zeros. So I made a memory dump of a bit of data right before that just to see if I could find the code of the bootloader itself right next to the RAM, which is what I expected. Luckily for me, the um, bootloader co at OF, uh, OXF88 and five zeros, um, which meant that I could then dump it and just statically analyze it in Ghidra if I needed to. Um, what I really wanted to do was get code execution so I could then modify the, um, the functionality of the device to bypass secure boot and get a bit more access to things, um, modify the kernel, etc. Um, but I found that they'd actually implemented DEP on the device, so data execution prevention, meaning that I couldn't overwrite the code in the bootloader in RAM because the memory management unit had disabled this. Um, when I tried this, it caused the device to hang because it hit a hardware error, um, implying that it was configured well. Um, and trying, however, I found that attempting to execute code outside of the code that had been allocated for the bootloader was possible. So if I just dumped a bunch of code just slightly outside of what had been mapped already, I could execute code from anywhere at the same exception level as the bootloader itself. 
So with this, I could patch in new functions if I wanted to, and when I'm writing even exploits for bootloaders, I like doing this in C. And just by using the GCC static no lib flags um, and using object copy, you can create a raw binary of any functions you're writing as long as you're not using standard libraries. So you would have to re-implement mem copy, but you've still got a lot of uh, ease over writing ARM assembly all day. Um, and because I could write these into, directly into memory, if I wanted to then write into the stack to point to them, that would be very easy as well, but I had another idea instead. So fastboot mode was used the basis of this exploit because I just really like fastboot mode, but also because it uses string-based commands for all of its administration. So what you'll find on um, bootloaders using fastboot is there will be um, a table of strings for the commands themselves and then pointers to specific functions. And this is usually stored in writable RAM regardless of where it is because they're loaded in via other functions. And by modifying this table, it would allow me to have easy code execution without modifying the stack, without having to do other complex things. I found that fastboot in this instance wasn't really used for an administration. It only had two commands, which were get variable, which had system variables, and reboot, which we wanted would reboot the device. So I chose get var because it was easier. Um, so the table usually looks like this. So you have an array, uh, array, uh, address pointing to the string, so reboot, and then address pointing to the function itself. This would mean that if there are any really complex um, things like uh, uh, stack canaries in place where I could still bypass them very easily, they wouldn't be a problem at this point because I was actually going to be, uh, see someone loading in the address itself and execute them. Um, because I had code execution, it meant that secure boot bypass would be possible. Um, so I could then modify the kernel without hopefully tripping knocks and uh, add malicious code into someone's phone when it was booting and do other uh, interesting things. However, I found that none of the USB based modes, so fast boot, download, etc., had the capability of just booting the phone itself, which would be a good way thing to hook into for this particular attack. What I would have to do was um, call into the uh, boot functionality that was already there for the standard boot mode. However, I found that this crashed the phone itself. Uh, which meant that I would actually have to implement boot functionality in a bootloader myself. So there are two options for the re-implementing the boot process. The first was to copy the entirety of working memory from the bootloader and put it somewhere where I could modify as I wanted to, or just re-implement the boot functionality from scratch, calling in functions that I needed to, to things like set up the hardware, set up the, um, the TE, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I chose the latter because it would be a lot easier for me to um, debug things, but also because there was a lack of writable memory at this point because all I was doing. Um, so functions in the bootloader could trivially be, be called by absolute addresses in C. So in C, you can literally say, I want to call a function at this address, and it will load it in and branch into them, and you can give it parameters, and that's what I wanted to do, so that I could just load in and check things that didn't work right, et cetera, or say, change parameters, or just remove functionality I didn't need. For instance, if the bootloader had already executed certain hardware setup, I wouldn't have to modify that anymore. Um, so I could literally like, cut down everything until I had the bare bones of a boot process for myself. Um, what was really lucky for me was that the bootloader contained a huge number of printf's throughout it for debugging, saying things like, oh, we're setting up this, this has failed, etc., which were all written into RAM address OXF 0070s. Um, by comparing my boot implementation to one that had worked legitimately, I could literally do a one-to-one -one comparison of what was broken and then check down the, the um, Ghidra until I had a boot process that looked almost identical superficially from the Spring's perspective, which was really nice. Um, then, at the end of this whole boot process, of course, it would have to jump into the kernel. Now, I found that on the um, bootloader, it was using KSLR, so it was putting in the kernel a randomized address within memory. But I also found that that randomized address was stored at a static pointer, which I could just load off and then execute into it, which was uh, nice and easy. However, I found that even booting into the kernel had some problems. So after I'd patched in all of what I thought were the appropriate functions, um, I wanted to execute the kernel. However, it started at the start of the process, it showed the boot screen and looked like it was going to start, and then hung and never started Android. However, I realized that because I'd already been modifying the boot code like this, and because the MMU was still in a position where the kernel code was writable, I could modify the kernel after it started in order to see what was going on and remove security components or uh, hardware initialization components to see what was actually going on and hopefully find the thing that was causing a crash. Um, after doing a bit of like, um, analysis by um, knocking out functions within the kernel itself, I found that the device uh, was freezing after the kernel reinitialized re the MMU. A key component of um, the kernel is it reinitializes a lot of the hardware registers that the bootloader has already done because they're not necessarily anymore. And so as soon as it was um, reinitializing the MMU with its own rearrangement of the memory, so setting up things like for kernel memory protection and things, um, it was causing the rest of the device to hang. And the reason for that was most likely going to be that the bootloader itself had other threads going on that were accessing memory that would no longer be accessible at this point.
So most Android bootloaders use a single thread for all functionality. They start up, they have some interrupts maybe, and then they've maybe got a USB interface, but literally all they want to do is get from A to B, which would be starting up to loading Android and executing. However, SBoot was found to implement an RTOS, which was much more fully featured and handled things like a much more complex um, graphics um, setup and a much more um, uh, um, uh, fully featured thing for the debugging um, and addressing it, etc. As you saw, there were a lot of printfs and things. There was a background process that was allowing those to be written into memory, etc. And it was really nice. And because the kernel was altering the MMU page tables, they were trying to um, execute unmapped memory, which was causing the hardware errors. So there were three threads that were identified on the device. There was the background tasks that I just talked about. There were the USB control transfers, which we what we were exploiting, and there was the high-level com USB communication, which was the download mode, the fast boot mode, etc. We were talking about. And as each one was constantly polling for the next interrupt it wanted and things, um, it was that that was causing the issue. And I also felt that because I didn't know much about how the RTOS was working, there was no trivial way for me to disable them individually. So I needed to come up with a much simpler solution for myself, just to kick them over and get myself into a position where there were no threads running. So a simple solution for me was going to be to throw an exception. When you throw an exception, all the threads sort of hang waiting for that exception to occur because they're usually doing something that's very timing or security critical. Um, and also, recovering from the exception wouldn't be required um, because we were trying to execute into the kernel, which would then reset off the um, exception registers and things. So I could literally just dump the kernel bootstrapping code into there, hopefully, and get where I wanted to be. So VBAR EL1, which was the uh, table that you just saw in the last slide, um, uh, is a um, register that points to a table in memory, which includes um, sequences of different exceptions, which are stored in 128 byte chunks. So every 128 bytes was a different exception type. I didn't really want to work out which exception was what. So what I ended up doing was doing a knob sled throughout the entirety of the exception table into my bootstrapping code at the end of memory, which would then execute it. So even with the kernel booting like this, and it did work, it's got further down the line, um, Android was still failing to start, reverting to a rec special recovery mode that was telling me that um, the file system manager was failing. The error message that I saw was suggested that it was um, due to the user, data, the user data partition not being decrypted. So on most Android devices now, user data is encrypted and using a hardware key, which needs to be um, uh, set up during boot to make sure that you can access your files. Um, what this implied to me is that I'd messed up somewhere and that the key storage or something else was not being enabled properly or had been broken in some manner by my bootstrapping. So analyzing the logs prior to boot found that there were multiple hardware initializations I had missed or ignored because I was um, being quite lazy with this project. Um, and this was due to the fact that they'd already been initialized by fast boot that required them for other purposes. Um, this included things like reading data and setting other things up. But essentially, I was sent running the same functions twice for setting up the TE, et cetera. By um, looking at the logs, I could see the error messages. For instance, key storage in, is, in it failed and tgris register handler uh, rep minus one, meaning that I'd have to do something to bypass this. Um, so both of these particular functions were enabled by a very, very large and complex function that would take a long time to um, uh, um, modify or bring back from scratch. However, I did end up doing that by fully re-implementing it, but checking for every if statement throughout the function um, for different set of hardware initializations and ignoring this, um, the code paths that I didn't think it would hit. Um, however, with these errors removed, the phone could then complete booting to Android. So I'm going to do another demo now, hopefully. Um. So here's the uh, phone in fast boot mode, and you'll see it very quickly go into the boot screen before switching back. So that screen you just saw was the one that happens when you just hold the power button on and turn on the phone, but as part of the boot process, it required it. It then shows the secured by knock screen, which uh, I'm not quite sure is true anymore at this point in the process. Um, you'll see a flicker um, occasionally um, in the screen where the kernel is rewriting that secured by knock screen and then you'll see that disappear. Now at this point I was very excited because this was meaning that we'd bypassed all of the hardware issues or the other issues I'd had in this process and we were now getting to the point where I was executing my custom modified kernel which I was peeking and poking into through this process. So in a second we'll see the uh, home screen and we'll know that my modified kernel was executing, which I was very happy with. Perfect. So um, there's a lot of things that can be done with um, kernel code execution. You can disable certain security features and things like that, but you have to be very careful because Samsung do put a lot of effort into making sure that there are checks in place that don't um, that 
if you do too, too many scary things, uh, Knox will blow a fuse, and permanently the device will say it can't be secured in the same manner because someone's been messing with it. Um, but very easily I could uh, modify the kernel uh, uh, boot, uh, proc version um, just to show hacked in the strings. Now I did modify this further to remove things like SE Linux checks, so just regardless of whether it had SE Linux in place, but I thought just a demonstrative picture of the version being modified was a good start for this. So some final notes on this case study. Um, because the exploit could now be triggered using an exception, it would be much easier for me to re-implement it in the download mode, which is much more common on Samsung devices, um, which would mean that the exploit would be much more far-reaching if I imp implemented it on a more expensive device. Um, and while code execution was possible, as I just said, there was still a tr uh, risk of triggering NOX. However, I didn't manage to do, do, do that during my analysis of this device. So, in conclusion of the two um, case studies we've discussed today, um, the initial vulnerability was disclosed to, uh, oh, sorry, we're doing the disclosures first, I'm getting my slides mixed up. Um, the initial vulnerability was disclosed to Samsung in December 2022, um, and they provided constant, up, um, um, constant updates on progress and patched the finding within three months across all their devices, which was extremely impressive considering the complexity of debugging this kind of thing. Um, so, the target device that I had after recording my demos for DEF CON uh, was updated, and I found it to no longer be vulnerable to the script overwrite vulnerability, meaning code execution but in this manner was no longer possible. Um, I will be, be releasing the tools for this on my GitHub, um, but you'll be able to find the um, link um, to my Twitter where I'll announce this in the slides, which you'll find on the DEF CON media server. So now conclusion. Um, so most devices, regardless of how much effort people put into protecting them, will still have exploitable vulnerabilities that can be ex exploited simply, despite there is resources. Um, and even with basic vulnerabilities, the effort required sometimes to go from a proof of concept to a full exploit is really rewarding. For instance, you saw that there was two very basic vulnerabilities in both of those case studies, which then took a certain amount of effort to actually make into a complete attack chain. And last of all, even on targets which have had a huge amount of research to put on them, there will still be a vector no one else has tried, so sh you should try it first. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have time for questions, and there's a microphone at the back of the room. I'm also happy for people to just shout at me, or I'll be um, outside in the hallway after this talk, so whatever works for everyone. <laughs>